morning, good afternoon, or good evening to wherever you are joining us from around the world. It's great to see everyone logging in and uh, settling in for today's BioGal webinar presented by Dr. Diane Addy about feline coronavirus and FIP, feline infectious uh, peritonitis. It's great to have you all joining in. I can see the chat uh, with lots of people saying hello. So welcome to everyone. It's it's great to see you here. Uh, a few things before I introduce Dr. Diane. Today's webinar will be recorded and it is available with live translation in Turkish, Portuguese and Spanish. If you have a look on your Zoom menu to the bottom or the side of your screen, you will see a interpretation uh, button that you can click and then you can select a language from there. So there is Portuguese, Turkish or Spanish live translation for today's webinar so you can listen along live. We will shortly be introducing Dr. Diane um, to talk to us about coronavirus and FIP. There will be a section at the end for questions and answers. We ask that if you have any questions during the webinar, that you please write them into the Q&A section of Zoom, not into the chat. So again, if you have a look in the menu of your, of your Zoom to the, to the bottom or to the side, you will see a Q&A box. If you write your question into that, then we can make sure that it is recorded and presented to Dr. Addy. So please make sure to put all questions there. If your question is not answered at the end of today's session, don't worry. It will be presented to Dr. Addy. She will answer it and all of the questions and answers will be sent along with the recording of the webinar at a later date. Um, so all questions into the Q&A box that they can be correctly recorded and you will get all of those answers along with the recording at a later date. My name is Jessica Case. I am the manager of Complete Veterinary Care. We are very proud to be the UK distributors for Biogirl. If there are any, uh, any people joining from the UK and you'd like to get in touch with us about any of Biogirl's products, you can contact us at info at cvcgroup.co.uk. Uh, and if anyone from around the world has any questions for Biogirl, you can contact them at info at so before I introduce Dr. Abby, just one more reminder to please put all questions into the Q&A box and that there is live translations in Spanish, Turkish and Portuguese available for the webinar today. Dr. Diane Adi is an independent veterinary virologist who was a senior lecturer and head of diagnostic virology at the University of Glasgow Veterinary School. For over three decades, her research has been devoted to feline coronavirus. Her website, catvirus.com, is dedicated to making feline infectious peritonitis, feline chronic gingivo, gingivo stomatitis, which is a very hard word to say, and other difficult to source and difficult to pronounce information freely available to veterinarians and the public. She is currently practicing online as a consultant in suspected FIP cases. Dr. Addy is a member of the European Advisory Board of Cat Disease, the ABCD, but the views expressed in this webinar are her own. ABCD members receive no uh, re remuneration for their ABCD work and they fiercely guard the independence of their sponsors. It's a great honor to introduce Dr. Diane Addy and I will hand over to her now. Thank you very much, Jessica. Hello and thank you for coming along to this webinar and many thanks to Louisa and everybody at Biogal for arranging the webinar. Today we're going to look at the pathogenesis of feline coronavirus infection and feline infectious peritonitis using actual case studies. We will follow the life cycle of feline coronavirus from its origins in the litter tray of an infected cat through the infection of a new victim where it goes in the body and then back out through the faeces of the newly infected cat. 
we will look at the consequences of each stage of infection with the help of the case studies of these cats, Luca, Tessa, Patrick, Jasper, Theo and Basil, and then see how in a minority of coronavirus infected cats, feline infectious peritonitis develops. You might find it useful to download a FIP diagnosis flowchart from my website www.catvirus.com. You just go to the Downloads and eBooks tab and the FIP Diagnosis Flowchart. The flowchart is now available in many languages thanks to volunteers. It's even in Japanese thanks to Dr. Hidemi Yasuda. But the English version is always the most up to date. And this is what you'll get in the English version. A flowchart of effusive FIP, non-effusive FIP, coronaviral diarrhea or enteritis, and a flowchart indicating how to proceed following your coronavirus antibody or RT-PCR test results. Step 1 of diagnosis involves taking a history. For FIP to develop, the cat must have been infected with feline coronavirus. Therefore, the history usually includes coming from a breeder or a rescue shelter within the previous months. Cats obviously evolved outdoors and they toilet outdoors as this cat is doing here. You can see that cats dig a hole and they bury their feces. Therefore, if this cat had been shedding coronavirus, it would not be available to other cats to become infected. It's extremely unlikely that this cat, as an outdoor cat, would be shedding coronavirus because the majority of coronavirus infected cats tend to be indoor cats from a multi-cat household. But even if the cat were shedding virus, the virus couldn't survive for long outside. The ultraviolet light from sunshine sterilizes viruses. This is why it's absurd for anybody to wear a mask outdoors to try to prevent coronavirus infection. First, masks don't work. That's been scientifically demonstrated. And secondly, the virus cannot survive for long outside. The coronavirus gets its name not from corona beer, as some people might think, because both the corona beer and the coronavirus make you feel awful, but because of these little spikes that you see on the right in the electron micrograph, which resemble a corona, which is Latin for crown. The spikes can easily be damaged, and since they are necessary for attachment to the cell receptor, they render the virus fragile, and coronaviruses are enveloped. All enveloped viruses are fragile. Therefore, the coronavirus cannot survive long in the environment, except in the case of feline coronavirus, when it is protected by faecal matter and cat litter. This cartoon shows how faecal oral transmission of feline coronavirus occurs. Here we have a coronavirus infected cat going to use a litter tray. And of course he passes feces in the litter tray and covers it up. However, the cat litter itself is now contaminated with the virus. Then in comes an uninfected cat who has to share the same litter tray. In covering up his toilet, his paws become contaminated with virus. And then of course he will groom it off. It'll get onto his tongue, be swallowed down his esophagus, end up in his intestines. And these are the villi of the intestine. And of course the epithelial cells of the villi of the small intestine are the initial target for this virus. In a sense, we humans are responsible for the FIP epidemic that we have seen in recent decades. When I was a new graduate vet many years ago, FIP was incredibly rare. So it's bringing cats indoors and making them use a litter tray, which has led to widespread infection of feline coronavirus. What two things do you notice about this young cat that would make you wonder about coronavirus infection or FIP as his diagnosis? I'll give you a clue. Look at his colour. Look at his appearance. Did you get them? The first is his breed. He looks pedigree. He looks like a British blue or a Russian blue cat possibly. But the second thing, the major thing, is his third eyelid protrusion. Protruding third eyelids or nictitating membranes is an indication of a gastrointestinal problem. 
usually an infection of the intestines. Compare Luca on the top right with the eyes of the coronavirus-free black kitten on the bottom. The third eyelid protrusion is more obvious on the cat on the top left. So that is one of the consequences of coronavirus infection of the intestines. Remember you saw on the cartoon that the first target for the coronavirus was the villi of the small intestines. And here you can see it stained in black in this uh, histopathological section of a small intestine of a young cat infected with feline coronavirus. You can see the infected cells stained in black by immunohistochemistry at the tips of the villi. This intestine looks remarkably like the small intestine of a piglet infected with transmissible gastroenteritis virus coronavirus. Similarly, the villi are stunted, the tips of the villi are ulcerated, and there is fusion of the villi leading to malabsorption. Therefore, the consequences of coronavirus infection of the small intestine are diarrhea and malabsorption syndrome leading to poor weight gain or weight loss and uneven litter size. So when young kittens are presented to you for vaccination, these are the clinical signs that you should be looking for that would indicate that they were infected with coronavirus. The protruding third eyelids, which may be quite subtle, you will have to look carefully, as you saw with Luca, and uneven litter size. If you're presented with the whole litter, that will be obvious. If you're presented simply with one kitten, that may not be so obvious. You'll be looking for the kitten being small for its age. These were litter mates. They are obviously of disparate sizes. And you may think that the kitten in the middle would be the first to develop FIP. But in fact, it was the kitten on the left who developed effusive FIP first and died at six months of age. Whereas the middle kitten developed FIP and died at 10 months of age. And only the cat on the right survived. Coronavirus diarrhea is usually mild or even inapparent and is usually transient. Often it won't even lead to cat guardians bringing a kitten or cat to you for treatment. However, about 13% of coronavirus infected cats become persistently infected. They become coronavirus carriers. And this is an example here in Tessa. This was what I was presented with. A cat with inflammatory bowel disease with a very painful anus. And you may be wondering, well, where has her fur gone? But she was a sphinx cat, so she had no fur. She presented with severe diarrhea. You can see that it is watery and defecating outside of the litter tray. You can see in this picture that she didn't quite make it to the litter tray that although she was trying to, half of her watery feces landed outside the litter tray on the carpet. She was extremely underweight at 1.9 kilo at six months old and she had a very painful anus. As you can see here, it's very inflamed. She was crying out in pain when she groomed herself and she was extremely underweight, weighing only 1.9 kilos at six months old. This is our third case, Patrick. Patrick had chronic diarrhea, well, dysentery, since he was adopted from a shelter in February 2023, and he was presented to me in October 2023. He'd had a coronavirus positive test in March, and we confirmed his status in October. There was one other cat in the house. Patrick's video is a photographic diary documenting his recovery from chronic enteropathy thanks to a seven-day course of treatment with GS441524 pills and using the Purina Fecal Scoring Chart to measure the response to treatment. This is the pre-treatment photograph showing that Patrick had endured essentially watery dysentery for the previous eight months, which at times he could not control. In other words, like Tessa, he had some faecal incontinence. His guardians reported that it was especially foul-smelling. This is faecal score 7, the worst on the chart. By day 2 of the oral antiviral treatment, the faecal score had improved slightly from 7 to 6. We are beginning to see a loggy faecal outline. On day 3 of treatment, the faecal score was still 6. 
By day four, we definitely saw a proper stool shape and the score had improved slightly to a five. On day six of the GS441524 pills, the score was still disappointingly a five, but just a day later there was a marked improvement to score four, however still deposited on the carpet, not the litter tray. Two days after the end of the seven-day GS441524 pill treatment, the score was still a four, and we wondered if that was as good as it would get. But by day 10, we saw an improvement to score three. And by day 14, after the start of treatment, we had a perfect fecal score of two. By the way, fecal score one is not perfect. It indicates constipation and the stools are over firm. About 50% of chronic enteropathy or inflammatory bowel disease cases are due to coronavirus infection and respond as well as this one does to treatment. Tessa also made a complete clinical recovery following a course of oral adenosine analog treatment. Let us take a moment to recapitulate where we have come to in the life cycle of the feline coronavirus. We have seen that it started its journey in the litter tray, it was swallowed and then attacked the epithelial cells of the small intestine, very often of kittens, causing diarrhea, malabsorption syndrome, and sometimes third eyelid protrusion. The virus was transported by macrophages from the intestine to the mesenteric lymph nodes, which are sometimes enlarged in coronavirus-infected cats. And indeed, mesenteric lymph node enlargement may be the main clinical sign seen in non-effusive FIP. After, there followed a brief systemic phase, where the virus then went to the ileocecal junction, as was discovered by Arnold Hereweg and his colleagues from Utrecht University. And it is during the systemic phase that the outcome of the feline coronavirus infection for the cat will be determined. The coronavirus doesn't want to go on and kill its host from FIP, but in 8 to 14% of cats and kittens, that is what happens. The virus probably only immunosuppresses its host in order for the cat to become a carrier cat. We have seen that for many carrier cats, this infection isn't subclinical, but can lead to quite severe inflammatory bowel disease. In 2005, Hannah Dewarchin and colleagues published an amazing paper where she took monocytes from cat blood and grew them in the laboratory. Monocytes are the precursor cells which become macrophages. As you know, monocytes and macrophages are the key cells in which feline coronavirus replicates in cats with feline infectious peritonitis. Dr. Dewarchin infected the cells with various strains of feline coronavirus, and surprisingly, it was the health of the monocyte, rather than the virulence of the strain of feline coronavirus, which determined whether viral replication was high or low. I'll just repeat that because it is important. It was the health of the monocyte, rather than the virulence of the strain of feline coronavirus, which determined whether viral replication was high or low. Obviously, viral replication has to be high, for FIP to develop. Jasper has very conscientious veterinary surgeons who recorded his weight every visit. You can see here his weight recorded every year when he went for his vaccine booster. In November 2018 at booster time, the vet noticed that he had lost 600 grams. Now this isn't a lot over one year. The weight had been lost gradually and they put it down to a change of food at the time. However, the fact of the vet noticing the weight loss and remarking upon it meant that his guardians were more aware of the cat's weight and they came in in the following January out of concern that he was still losing weight. Blood tests and a biopsy were done, FIP was diagnosed, the cat was treated with mutian pills and he is alive and well two years on. As we have already seen, an outcome of FIP is a dead-end side road of the feline coronavirus cycle of infection of a new host, replication in the new host, virus shedding in the faeces, and then the cycle beginning all over again. If a cat develops FIP and dies, that is the end of the coronavirus infecting him. 
We know feline coronavirus replicates more successfully in the monocytes of cats who develop FIP than in cats who do not develop FIP. French virologist Francois Beguini made this beautiful animation of FIP pathogenesis for me. Here we have a coronavirus infecting a monocyte. We don't see what goes on actually in the monocyte, the virus replicating. But we do see the monocyte adhering to the endothelial cells lining a blood vessel. The infected monocyte releases metalloproteinases, which causes retraction of the endothelial cells. That way, the monocyte can extravasate out of the blood vessel into the surrounding tissue and differentiate into a macrophage, releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines. The cytokines cause more adhesion molecules to be expressed and attract more at monocytes and polymorphonuclear leukocytes, in other words neutrophils, and you end up with a pyogranuloma surrounding the blood vessel. If there are many blood vessels affected, you get leakage of fluid out of the blood vessels. And we clinicians see this as ascites, pleural effusion or pericardial effusion, and we call it wet FIP. The effusion is typically straw-coloured, without a bad smell, unlike in bacterial infections. It is usually clear-coloured, but it can be serosanguinous or it can be like chyle. Here Professor Kipper shows a longitudinal section of a blood vessel and you can see coronavirus stained monocytes adhering to the endothelial cells. This was an absolutely stunning study that she did and published some years ago. Histopathologically, the lesions of FIP typically surround a blood vessel. You can see that in this kidney. This is what we're looking for when we do a histopathological diagnosis of FIP. On the left, there's a probable FIP lesion, but we've just missed the blood vessel when taking our section of the kidney. And this is a gross postmortem of an effusive case of FIP, where you can actually see the pyogranulomata with the naked eye, and you can see again that they're associated with blood vessels. Nine out of ten veterinary surgeons thought that Theo had effusive FIP. Do you agree with them? Theo was a six-month-old Bengal cross tabby cat who presented to his primary veterinary surgeon in June 2021 with severe abdominal enlargement which was due to ascites. Theo was presented to me in July 2021 because he had been on oral GS441524 treatment for three weeks but his effusion was getting worse instead of better. Was his FIP treatment not working? Why was his FIP treatment not working? There were three possible explanations. First, he didn't really have FIP. Second, the coronavirus infecting him was resistant to the anti-coronavirus drug being used. Or third, he had a second condition in addition to FIP, giving the impression that his FIP wasn't responding to treatment. Diane's first rule of FIP treatment is always check the FIP diagnosis, so that is what we'll do now. Theo was bought from a person claiming to be a cat breeder, so we put a tick for the first question. The second question is related and we can't comment. The third question is age and he was only six months old, so we put a tick here. The fourth question is about stress. He had received his second vaccine mid-April, so yes, that was a stress. We'll tick that box. Step two is the clinical examination. As we've already seen, Theo was grossly ascitic. This was confirmed by ultrasound. However, he was bright and active, and this can be the case in effusive FIP, whereas in non-effusive FIP, the cat is typically dull and inappetent. The attending clinician noted that Theo was thin, despite the huge abdomen. 
His veterinary notes did not record whether or not he was pyrexic. Moving on to step three, this is an examination of the effusion usually performed in-house. Let us zoom in on this box. An effusion sample was taken and it was serosanguinous in appearance, which is consistent with FIP, so we'll put a tick there. The other measures were not performed except the Rivalta test, which was positive, so that gets a tick too. I would urge you to watch my video about the Rivalta test if you haven't already done so. It should be mainly used to rule out FIP, but never to make a firm diagnosis of FIP. The predictive value positive of a Rivalta test is only 58%, which is just a little bit over chance. The effusion sample was sent off for feline coronavirus RT-PCR testing, which is step four of the algorithm. And here is where the big surprise came. The result was negative. So what does the algorithm say when we have a negative RT-PCR? It says the predictive value of a negative FECOV RT-PCR on an effusion depends entirely on the sensitivity of the test being used. Well, the laboratory which tested the effusion was IDEX UK, which is a well-established laboratory. There was no real reason to doubt this result. Nevertheless, on the basis of what we have seen so far, especially the Rivalta test, the vets diagnosed FIP and the cat's guardians set about doing everything they could to save Theo. They purchased mutian pills, which have an excellent track record for curing FIP. Three weeks after starting Mutin, Theo was no better. His attending vets were pushing for euthanasia, but his guardians wanted a second opinion. Reading Theo's history and laboratory results, I was struck by several things that I would not expect in the case of FIP. The first, obviously, was the lack of response to Mutian. I have never known a cat with FIP to not recover rapidly when on Mutian pills. Second was that his globulins hadn't increased in the two times they were tested, and they were rather low at 28 and 27 grams per litre. The normal is under 45 grams per litre. Cats with FIP usually have hyperglobulinemia. The third, obviously, was the negative coronavirus RT-PCR on the effusion. Meanwhile, Theo's guardians changed their primary veterinary surgery as well. Fikov RT-PCR on ascites was repeated and once again was found to be negative. In spite of this, the new vets were insisting that Theo had FIP and they recommended euthanasia. Theo saw nine vets who said he had FIP and recommended euthanasia. Fortunately for Theo, his guardians did not comply. My recommendation was for a feline coronavirus antibody test so a blood sample was sent to Glasgow Veterinary School Laboratory. His feline coronavirus antibody titer was zero. He had not been exposed recently to feline coronavirus. The double negative results convinced me that Theo did not have FIP. However, his alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, AGP, level was raised, indicating infection or inflammation. And the ultrasound examinations had shown abdominal masses. I recommended an exploratory laparotomy, but the vets were insistent that this would be cruel. He had FIP and should be humanely put to sleep. By now, Theo was going downhill fast. We had to do something. Eventually, I wrote a stiff letter to the attending vets insisting that Theo be given a chance and have the operation. But of course, I had doubts. Suppose I was wrong. So many other vets were sure this was FIP. Theo was hospitalised and two litres of abdominal effusion were drained over a period of three days. Then he was operated on and the spleen with its mass were removed and sent for histopathology. His ascites had been caused by an abscess on the spleen. The effusion was sent for bacterial culture and antibiotic sensitivity. An unusual bacterium called Pseudomonas was isolated. Theo was treated with antibiotics and put into a cone to protect his stitches. Here is Theo looking very happy to be home from the veterinary surgery and enjoying a well-earned rest. This photo shows how bright and interested he was after his operation. Here is Theo cuddling up with his girlfriend after the stitches were taken out. Theo is alive and well six months on. 
there are lessons we can learn from Theo's case. First, a positive Rivalta test is not diagnostic of FIP. Rivalta tests should be mainly used to exclude a diagnosis of FIP. Second, a sensitive, accurate feline coronavirus antibody test would have saved Theo's guardians, a young couple, over £5,000. More importantly, a feline coronavirus antibody test would have saved this cat weeks of suffering. If Theo had belonged to anybody but Callum and Lily, it is likely that the FIP misdiagnosis would have cost him his life. Most of those nine vets wanted to euthanize him. The vets told Theo's guardian that they didn't trust the feline coronavirus RT-PCR results. I think this case shows the importance of using laboratories and tests that you can rely upon. Tests with good specificity and sensitivity, especially sensitivity in this case. I would like to take a moment to remind you of your undergraduate training. Sensitivity is the ability of a test to detect a small amount of something. Specificity is the ability of the test to detect something correctly. To rule out a differential diagnosis, you require a test that is exquisitely sensitive so that you do not risk getting a false negative result. For confirming a diagnosis, you require a test that is very specific because you do not want a false positive result which would cause you to give the wrong treatment. Test manufacturers usually have to balance sensitivity and specificity, which is why one often has to use two different tests. For example, we screen for feline leukemia virus with a very sensitive in-house test, but we check our positive results by sending the samples to a laboratory for a specific confirmatory test. Theo's vets said that they didn't believe the negative feline coronavirus RT-PCR results on his societies, despite the high predictive value negative of such a test. In other words, they thought that the tests were insensitive, even though the tests were performed by two different laboratories, and even though RT-PCR tests are usually very sensitive if done properly. Please watch my video about choosing a reliable laboratory. Luca's story was the opposite of Theo's. Luca did have FIP, confirmed by histopathology, but his veterinary surgeons unfortunately sent his samples to Antec Laboratory in the United States, which reported a negative feline coronavirus antibody test, wrongly calling it FCV, which is the abbreviation for feline calicivirus, not coronavirus, which tells you already how incompetent that laboratory was. A look at the Antec website in 2023 shows you that they are still claiming to have an FIP-specific antibody test. If we click on the button, we get this. We zoom in a bit. Their so-called specific FIP test is the 7B ELISA, a test that was discredited by Melissa Kennedy back in 2008. Zooming in on the conclusion, she said seropositivity for the 7B protein was not specific for a diagnosis of FIP. A feline coronavirus antibody test is not an FIP test. It is a test for coronavirus antibodies. Subclinically coronavirus infected cats who appear to be healthy and cats with diseases other than FIP often have feline coronavirus antibodies especially if they are from a multi-cat environment. This is Luca's feline coronavirus RT-PCR test result. As we've already seen, a feline coronavirus viremia is brief and has usually ended before clinical signs of FIP appear. Therefore, the chances that an RT-PCR test on blood will be negative in cats with FIP is very high and predictively Luca's test result was negative. The laboratory shouldn't be asking for blood. So he had two negative results on different kinds of tests, but unfortunately using a poor laboratory. The reason we don't call Luca's RT-PCR result a false negative is because probably there was no messenger RNA in Luca's blood by the time he developed FIP. His veterinary surgeons should have done the test on a fine needle aspirate of an infected organ, preferably a mesenteric lymph node, not blood. 
Unfortunately, there are no published papers comparing the sensitivity and specificity of available feline coronavirus RT-PCR tests. However, in 2015, I published in the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery an independent assessment of feline coronavirus antibody tests, and the results were surprising. We hadn't expected to find a test that was both 100% sensitive and 100% specific, but the feline coronavirus immunocomb correctly identified all of 78 antibody positive and 121 antibody negative samples. At that time, I was using a computer program that Biogal had that worked with an ordinary computer scanner to read the results, which eliminated human error to some extent. This is the fourth page of the catvirus.com FIP diagnostic algorithm, but it will only work if you use good tests and reliable laboratories. I would like to draw your attention to this key message. A positive feline coronavirus antibody test is not diagnostic of FIP, even if the antibody titer is high. I can't believe that I am still having to say that. Yet only last week I was presented with a case where the vet believed that a high coronavirus antibody titer meant that the cats had FIP. What an idiot. We come to our last case, Basil, an 11-month-old British shorthair cat with effusive FIP. You can see that his abdomen is distended and the reason for that was abdominal effusion. Basil will be the subject of several videos on my YouTube channel, but for this webinar, I would like to concentrate on his anemia. As you know, FIP, like any chronic inflammatory disease of the cat, FIP causes non-regenerative anemia. Basil presented in the days before nucleoside analog drug treatments. So the 3C protease inhibitor, GC376, had been ordered for him, and while we waited for that to arrive, he was treated with polyprenal immunostimulant, weekly vitamin B12 injections, and meloxicam. At the time, we were also using itraconazole, which had been shown to have in vitro effects against coronavirus, but I definitely would not recommend using itraconazole now. Despite these treatments, Basil's hematocrit continued to fall, until it was getting to a life-endangering level by day 12. His attending primary veterinary surgeons wanted to give him a blood transfusion, but I opposed that because two similar cases, Luca, whom you met earlier, and Rowley, had died within hours of a blood transfusion, despite careful matching of the blood groups. I suggested we use erythropoietin, i.e. darbipoietin, instead and happily his veterinary surgeons agreed to this. Feline interferon omega, the brand Verbigen omega, arrived on day 12 of Basil's hospitalization, and Darby Poetin arrived on day 14. It appeared as though those treatments were working because Basil's hematocrit began to increase. However, on day 17, when his GC376 arrived, his hematocrit began to reduce again. What was going on? Was he reacting badly to GC376? Something about the wave pattern of Basil's hematocrit looked familiar to me. I'd seen something like it somewhere before. It reminded me of a graph in a paper by Severine Tasker, an expert in feline infectious anemia. This is the graph from that paper. Professor Tasker and colleagues plotted Mycoplasma haemophilus organisms rising and falling in the bloodstream, shown here in the black line with the diamond shapes, and the hematocrit of the infected cats shown in the line with the white circles falling during the waves of parasitemia. I thought perhaps Basil was also infected with Mycoplasma haemophilus and I recommended we start him immediately on doxycycline pills. This is what happened. His red blood cell count recovered completely and so did Basil. The key message from this case study illustrates Rule 7 of my 10 rules for preventing FIP relapses. Don't mistake concurrent disease for treatment failure. A PDF of the 10 rules can be downloaded for free from my website www.catvirus.com.
Feline infectious peritonitis attacks a key cell of the immune system, the lymphocyte. Therefore, it immunosuppresses cats with FIP, and they can then sometimes get another secondary infection or condition. Thank you for attending this webinar. If you found it helpful, you might want to watch other webinars BioGal have kindly hosted, one on FIP diagnosis and prevention, and another on FIP treatment. To access my YouTube channel to see fuller versions of the case studies presented today and other case studies, just type Diane Diaddy into the YouTube search box. I will be happy to take your questions, but first I want to thank the guardians of these cats who allowed their stories to be used for educational purposes. I thank the catvirus.com subscribers and donors who make my work possible and of course many thanks to BioGal for hosting this webinar. For more information on feline coronavirus and FIP, please go to my website www.catvirus.com. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Addy. That was really helpful, uh, very, very interesting and informative. And I'm sure that everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you so much for your expertise. We've had some questions come in, uh, which I'd like to present to you. Uh, the first one is, we have a cat patient with an immunochrome score of six. Her AG ratio is one. She does not show any symptoms. She has only growth retardation. She is a one-year-old female and weighs two kilograms. She constantly goes into heat and this creates stress for her. We want to neuter her, but we are afraid of triggering FIP. What would you advise, please? Yes, uh, this is a really good question because it illustrates um, that, they, that so many cats have coronavirus antibodies and about only one third of cats with coronavirus antibodies are act actively infected at the time. So one thing you could do is test the feces by RT-PCR to see if she's actually shedding virus. But we do know that some cats with, corona with FIP rather don't shed coronavirus anymore in the feces. They, there's a, a deletion in their 3C gene which stops them shedding coronavirus. So if you found that she was shedding coronavirus, you would know she was actively infected. Um, but if she was negative, there would still be that little bit of doubt. If you have available any access to an acute phase protein test, that would be the very best thing you could do. Um, the AGP is obviously the one that I prefer, as, as you saw with the Theo um, case report. But it would also be worth using serum amyloid A, SAA, if you don't have access to AGP testing. If the cat is incubating FIP, then acute phase proteins will be high. Now, the, it's good to know the difference because if she's just shedding virus and you give her oral GS441524 pills, which are legally available now in in several countries, thanks to BOVA compounding, or if you use monupiravir, which again is legal um, in some countries, it's, it's more, in some countries apparently it's not because they want to use it for humans only with coronavirus infection. But if you can get hold of an oral antiviral, um, if she's shedding virus in her feces, then one week, will will cure her as you saw with Patrick and Tessa. If she's incubating FIP though, you will need at least seven or eight weeks of um, treatment. And what you would do is monitor the acute phase protein response after about four to five weeks to see if it's going down okay. And then when it's gone down to normal, it will be safe to neuter her. Um, if, if you want to email me directly about that. My email address is draddy at catvirus.com.
that's just D-R-A-D-D-I-E at catvirus.com. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you. Jessica. Thank you very much. Uh, another question has come in that says, for the diagnosis with PCR, is it necessary to perform sequencing to know if it is FIP and not just feline coronavirus? <laughs> That's a, a super um, question too. Um, you're thinking probably about the IDEX test with the mutations. Um, no, uh, the mutation tests are less sensitive than the other um, RT-PCR tests. The IDEX one that just says for feline coronavirus is adequately sensitive. And if you get a positive on that from an effusion or from a fine needle aspirate, then that is pretty nearly definitely diagnostic of FIP. You hear of the very odd rare exceptions, but at that stage you would use the treatment, the antiviral, and you would expect to be seeing improvement in the cat within a week. Um, on my YouTube channel, you would also find a film about monitoring weight as a very inexpensive way of telling whether cats are recovering or not. In fact, it's free if you've actually got skills already. Um, it, it, P Professor Peterson discovered that, that that was a useful thing to do in his 2019 paper, I think. So that's the way I would go with that case. Thank you for the question. Excellent. Next question is, why is the oral route recommended and not the injected route to prevent relapses? I love that question. I've made a film about that recently, um, which is on YouTube and BitChute and Odyssey, I think. Um, it may be blurry, though, so I'm going to have to redo, re-upload them at a better definition. I'm sorry about that. But the reason for not giving injections is that we showed that the injections don't adequately reach, reach the gut, which you've just seen from this um, webinar, is the site of the major viral replication. So all the virus in the cat... It, normally is being made around the large intestine, the colon. And that's where you want to attack the virus first. Um, and uh, the, the antiviral will be absorbed from the gut into the system and will get to the other organs where the FIP is manifesting. So the injections will, uh, will get to the virus in the other organs, but not reliably get to the virus in the gut. And we found that with one cat who got injections and got better from his FIP, he was still shedding the virus from his gut even two years on. And what we've also noticed is that the cats that started their injections with, um, with started their treatment by injections rather than pills were much more likely to relapse. And they were much more likely to relapse with neurological signs. I'm not the only one who's noticed this. If you scan down um, the Roy paper on molnupiravir treatment. Now, Jessica, I'm the one that can't pronounce things. Um, if you scan Dr. Roy's paper, you'll see that the majority of those cases began treatment with um, injections. And so I, I have a, a whole video on that subject alone. Um, there are two sort of twin videos, and I would recommend please watch them both um, to, to fully understand the mechanisms there and, and how starting with an injection could trigger resistance to the antiviral um, in the virus. So that's not something you want to be doing. No, that's excellent. Thank you. I'm sure those videos will be really helpful. Uh, we've had a question come in from Professor Richard Ford. Uh, thank you very much, oh, Professor welcome. Ford. Uh, his question is, feline uh, coronavirus is highly transmissible, for example, queen to kitten. On the other hand, FIP virus is not considered transmissible, transmissible, yet it does seem to occur within multiple cat households, albeit rarely. What is the mechanism slash, slash pathogenesis whereby feline coronavirus during its transition to FIP virus is transmissible. Oh, Dr. Ford, <laughs> you've put me on the spot now, haven't you? 
Okay. Uh, I've got to admit, I don't believe the internal mutation theory. I just don't think it's right. Um, we've seen the, the Dewerchin paper during this um, webinar. And in, in that paper, they were using different strains of virus that with known differing um, virulence including the notorious 791146, very virulent type two strain. Um, and it was the monocyte of the cat that determined whether or not there was a lot of viral replication that controlled the, um, the outcome, if you like. Had those monocytes been in a cat rather than in cell culture, you would have had FIP deaths. Now, many, many years ago, Professor Peterson and um, his colleague, Dr. Black, published a paper where they increased gradually the virus load in experimental infections of experimental laboratory cats. And at a very low um, amount of a very low virus dose, some of, none of the cats got FIP. And this is what we see in the field normally. As you increase the virus load, some cats get FIP. Um, and as you go over a certain virus load, many of the cats died of FIP. So I believe that that, that experiment that Professor Peterson did was the answer to why we see the pattern that we see. A caveat to that is um, there have been a number of outbreaks. Um, Dr. Wang, um, documented uh, outbreaks in a shelter. And that was because of recombination of the, the feline coronavirus that was infecting the cats with canine coronavirus giving rise to a type 2 coronavirus, hmm. which devastated a lot of the cats. So we know that we can get more virulent um, strains spontaneously arise from recombination and cause an outbreak. So these are things actually of um, a, a, a video that I'm preparing. I've got a cartoonist to, to um, make me a video, but he wasn't as good as Francois Baghini, and I'm not totally sure I'll use the video, um, but it, it's, it's something I, I will be explaining further. The, the internal mutation theory has been around for as long as I have or, or longer, that's a very long time. And we've seen various um, people go away. I found the internal mutation. You know, the 7B one was notorious. It was found to be a laboratory artifact. Mm -hmm. uh, you, grow the, you grow the virus in cell culture, it kicks out the 7B gene. It doesn't need it anymore. Uh, I could go on a bit and I will make a, a video about that. but. I'm sorry, I just don't believe the internal mutation theory. The evidence has never been there convincingly. We know there are different strains of coronavirus with different virulence. Um, so it's, it's that, it's virus load, it's the host's immunity. I also, in a recent video, showed that, um, that cats, uh, their monocytes don't work as well if they don't have enough arginine. They're obligate carnivores. They need plenty of arginine. They need meat. I hate to say that as a lifelong vegetarian, but um, our, our pussycat friends can't be vegans like we can. Not that I can. I'm still trying <laughs> so hard. Jeez, Jesus needed. <laughs> oh, Jesus, so hard. The, the vegan <laughs> ones just don't cut it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for that answer. And uh, I hope uh, Dr. Ford found that as interesting as I did as well. Um, so one last question. Uh, given the importance of population level surveillance for coronavirus, what challenges exist in implementing effective surveillance programs? And how can advancements in diagnostics contribute to more comprehensive monitoring of coronavirus prevalence in different cat populations? Thank you for that question. Um, it, it often puzzles me that as, as clinicians, we run FELV, FRV tests daily, but we don't run coronavirus antibody tests daily um, on, on sick patients or on new cats 
or, or for screening. Um, and I, I would like to see coronavirus antibody results be used more regularly, um, reliable ones, though there are some pretty dodgy rapid immunomigration tests out there. One of them that, that I looked at, we looked at more tests in the comparison study than we published in the paper, because um, I approached many laboratories and many um, test makers, and I said, do you want to give us some of your tests? Um, and if you, you give us some, we will, um, you will then have the option of whether we publish or not. Um, so I was just asking people to volunteer. And I got some where they said, here are the tests, but please don't publish. And one of them actually managed to be worse than chance. You know, a tossed coin. And I thought, how is that even possible? But um, obviously, I, I did not reveal their, um, their, their name because it was done in confidence. And hopefully, they used that information to make the test better. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Um, okay. Well, I think uh, we have run out of time. Uh, there are some more questions that have come in. So thank you to everyone that sent those in. They will be answered uh, by Dr. Addy and recorded. And these will be sent along with the recording of this webinar. Um, so don't panic if your question wasn't answered now. You will get an answer from Dr. Addy uh, when you get the recording of this webinar. Thank you so much again, Dr. Addy. That was uh, really fascinating and so helpful. And we really appreciate your time and your expertise in this. Um, thank you to Biogirl Labs for hosting this webinar. Please, uh, everyone that is taking part, uh, keep an eye out for more webinars that will be coming up soon. You can have a look on the Biogirl website, biogirl.com. And uh, Thank you so much for taking part. Thank you for your questions and for uh, all of your comments in the chat. I wish you all a very happy holiday season and a healthy new year. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you so much and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you to the translators as well. Bye bye.